Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline for another Maddich Monday is ESPN college football insider, expert, and analyst, and a national champion in 1984, Trevor Maddich. Trevor, welcome back to the program. Hi. I wish it were under different pretenses, yeah. my friend. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what are your biggest takeaways from BYU's home loss to Cal? Well, the more things change, the more they stay the same is what my thought was. The the first half, I thought the BYU offense didn't finish drives, but they strung together a lot of plays. They didn't have big plays, but they were able to, to build up first downs. They were able to keep the Cal defense on the field. And I thought, okay, even though they've only got seven points here, in the second half, if they can keep doing that, they should be able to take over just because of the physical pounding they put on the Cal defense. But in the second half, BYU had two three and outs, and that's it. Cal dominated the th in the third quarter. Cal dominated the third quarter, and I got the impression that the rather than being worn out and pounded into the turf in the third quarter by the BYU offense, that Cal defense was on the sideline and finally had to jog around the stadium in order to stay loose. You know, so that's a whole lot different from wearing them out. And I tell you, just the way that it flipped after halftime was so frustrating to watch. The question now is, is BYU the team we saw against Arizona or the team that we saw against Cal? Uh, most of the time these questions are somewhere in the middle, but what do you think? Uh, I think it's, well, I think it's closer to the team we saw against Cal. And in fairness, the team that, you know, Arizona, um, when they played Houston, their big hope is, has always been their quarterback, Khalil Tate. And, and he tweaked his ankle, I believe, early in that game. And they weren't able to use him in ways that they really wanted to. And kind of the wheels fell off. So, you know, don't, don't look at that Houston score and say, yeah, Arizona is just horrible. You know, it was a different Arizona team that faced Houston. But the, the thing I worry is this. In, in both games, Houston and Cal, BYU's defense played very well. Not perfectly, but I thought they played very well. The biggest difference is that against Arizona, the BYU passing attack came alive for a bit, especially in the second half. You know, they got some vertical passes, some things happened that opened everything else up. It opened up the running game when the passing game started to work more down the field. But against Cal, it was revert to form. The passing game just wasn't getting much done. And because of that, uh, the dominoes that fell in favor of BYU's offense in general uh, in the second half against Arizona fell against BYU in the second half, especially against Cal. Trevor Maddich of ESPN with us on BYU Sports Nation. Tanner Mangum, uh, the head of that passing attack for BYU, 22 for 41. How would you assess his overall performance against Cal? Uh, I am... Uh... It, it, the passing game in general was pretty awful. Part of it was Tanner Mangum. Part of it was drops, though. There, there, he had at least five drops that would have changed the game if the receivers would have held onto those balls. There were times when the Cal defense had some really creative blitzes and pass rushes that confused the protection a bit, and so he didn't have time to throw. But when he did have time to throw, it was too often that he was throwing at receivers. In other words, he would see a receiver and say, I'll throw it to that guy. And then he throws to the receiver where the receiver is when he lets go of the ball. That's one of the reasons I think that you saw so many of his passes end up being behind the receivers. The receivers would have to stop. They'd have to reach back uh, because you're throwing at the guy. What he needs to get to the point of is throwing to a spot in front of the receiver anticipating that, that the receiver will get there and choose that spot not because he sees a guy open, but because he sees the coverage, and by knowing the coverage, he knows where to throw the ball and when to get it there. And they're not there right now. Now, in fairness to Tanner, I I'm, I'm very reluctant to be overly critical of him. He gives everything he's got to this program. He is an outstanding leader. He's an inspirational figure. And he's had, what, three different offensive coordinators? And then he's been hurt. And so he hasn't really been able to develop in one system where he's been able to put all this together. But 
right now, I think it's up to the offensive coaching staff to see where he is right now and what he can do best. And and help him by calling the kinds of plays and the kinds of routes that they know he can do. And after two games, I think they have a, an idea of what that might be. And the truth of it is, part of that is some of those vertical routes where they need to build in short drops, throw the ball up high in the air that receivers can run underneath as they're going deep down the field. And I think that from a standpoint of deep strikes, um, you may see some more of those kinds of attempts in the games as we go forward. At what point, if at all, do you consider going to Zach Wilson? You just said that you don't want to be overly critical of Tanner Mangum. He's had three offensive coordinators. Last year, you kind of put last year. But at what point in the next several weeks or whatever, if at all, do you look at putting Zach Wilson in? What situation would have to happen? Well, uh, I think it would be good for the program to give Zach Wilson a chance. I think you, you never know how a guy is going to – perform and they've got some tough games coming up and what you don't want to do is put him in in a situation that he is virtually guaranteed to have his confidence ground into powder on the into the turf of Madison Wisconsin or Seattle Washington and so I think that they've got to be judicious about it Uh, McNeese is coming up after Wisconsin, and I think that might be the best time to really give him a chance in meaningful minutes. In other words, if if either the, if the Wisconsin game gets out of hand, then maybe you know he can go in and, and maybe see what he can do a little bit for a series or two. But I think his mental makeup is more important than the physical side right now, and they've got to be careful to give him a, a good chance to succeed. Now, the flip side of that is that there's Tanner Mangum in there taking all the the hardest hits that those defenses can can throw at him. But he's a senior, and he ought to be able to do that. I am also not calling for Tanner Mangum to be benched. But what I am saying is that we've seen around the country quarterback scenarios where you've got an experienced veteran and a young hotshot. And what those do at Clemson, at uh, um, Georgia, at Alabama, um, and those have resolved in different ways now in the first couple weeks of the season. But – In a place like Clemson, what they chose to do was play the experienced veteran, let the young guy come in and get some meaningful reps and see if he can play his way into the job. But if you if you you know if you give too much to the young guy too soon, once again, then then you have to like sit him down and not let him play much for a while, and that hurts him. Uh, So I guess that's the long answer to a short question that um, I'm not calling for Tanner's job. But I think that there should come a time when they give the kid a chance, and I think that time will probably come against McNeese. ESPN college football expert Trevor Maddich. It's another Maddich Monday on BYU Sports Nation. The BYU defense came up with three takeaways, two on defense, including a scoop and score, BYU's only touchdown in the game until the final minute of play. But they didn't get a ton of pressure on Cal and their quarterback situation. So how would you assess the BYU defense overall on Saturday? I thought the BYU defense was great. They held Cal to a field goal in the uh, second, in the first half. In that third quarter when BYU's defense completely disappeared, they held Cal to just one touchdown. You know, they came up with those turnovers. They scored a touchdown of their own. Special teams, Diane Gowalaku ends up with that recovery of a muff punt on the Cal 16-yard line. And in a game that BYU ended up losing by three points, they didn't even get off a field goal attempt because of an interception by the BYU offense on that drive. And when you leave the defense on the field for a long time, bad things are going to happen. And BYU's defense minimized those bad things. Now, they didn't get a whole lot of pressure. But at the same time, they they did a good job of, of – putting their finger in the dike to keep the the water from pouring through and turning into a flood. Now, against Cal, that's one thing. Against Wisconsin, the BYU offense cannot hang them out like this. Just think about the LSU game. Um, you know, when the offense didn't do anything and the defense got overwhelmed after time. Look at the Wisconsin game last year. This one at Madison, you know, the defense, I think, is, is playing well enough to be a, a nine-win team, eight-nine-win team. Um, the offense needs to help them out. And it won't show up in such big ways against teams that are more, you know, BYU's own size. But against, against Wisconsin and against the Washingtons of the world, the offense needs to help them. 
When you look at the matchup with Wisconsin, you touched on it earlier, but what will it take for BYU to be competitive against the Badgers, who are in the top ten? Well, this is going to sound completely shocking and something that we've never heard before, but <laughs> they've got to throw the ball with some success. Wisconsin has got a stout defensive line. They have got phenomenal linebackers. I mean active, disrupting linebackers. I don't expect BYU to push Wisconsin's defense around because I do think BYU's offensive line is really, really good. But Wisconsin's is the best in the country. and They, they have four offensive linemen that last year earned some sort of All-America honors that are starting again for them this year. This is the offensive line of Wisconsin that the Wisconsin defense faces in practice every day. So the Badgers won't be intimidated by any physicality of BYU because they won't play. There's not more than two or three teams in the nation that will be more physical than what they face in practice. That means that for BYU to be able to have a chance to keep this thing competitive, the passing game has to work to the extent that they can let their defense rest a little bit. You know, BYU has such stout defensive linemen. They are so active in the front seven that I think they'll be able to hold their own quite a bit, at least for a while, against Wisconsin's offense. But if they're out there too much, if it's just three and out, three and out, three and out from BYU's own offense, then the the dam could break open. So uh, they they need to throw the ball successfully and move the chains through the air in order to have a chance to keep this thing competitive. Trevor, we always appreciate the national perspective. Uh, great to catch up with you again on Monday and uh, interested to see what BYU can do against Wisconsin and what that will lead to in our conversation next week. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. Trevor Maddich on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, your values, your timeline, your financial future.